Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day, and this is Mally the Maker. This is a doll pattern based on a character in a book, Mally the Maker and the Queen in the Quilt. And this is actually the second doll pattern I have created from this book. This is Miss Bunny, another character who comes to life within the world of quilts. That's the only sneak peek I'm gonna give you. You have to read the book and it is a really fun read. It's an amazing adventure and friendship story between these two characters. So with Miss Bunny and her pattern, you learned how to make that doll and how to sew her a dress and panties. <laughs> with Mally, we are learning how to sew the doll. We gave her a big full head of hair and that was another video. And in this video, we're going to sew her a t-shirt. So cut out your fabrics and join in the fun. You can find the pattern for this Mally doll at mallythemaker.com. So here are our shirt pieces. We have a front and back shirt and two sleeves. And you can see I've cut these out in a pink 1930s reproduction print. I think this is a really good choice. And I think small scale prints are generally a good idea when making doll clothing. Now we have four pieces of hem slash kind of binding. Um, these are the sleeve hems. The bottom hem of the shirt is the longest piece and then the medium length piece is gonna be cut on the bias and this is the neckline. You wanna take all of these and fold them in half carefully and press with a hot dry iron. Be especially gentle with the bias neckline piece because bias, that angle, just really likes to stretch and wiggle out of control. So be really, really gentle as you press this in half. And the reason why we're using uh, these pieces is this is actually a very standard t-shirt build. If you actually look closely at a t-shirt that you own, um, how we're gonna put this together is very, very similar to how you would make a t-shirt for yourself. The only difference would be knit fabric versus cotton fabric. We're using cotton fabric here for Mally just simply because it's easier to work with on this small scale. But if you wanted to make yourself a t-shirt, I would recommend knit fabric. Uh, and then you would cut that out and cut out some little binding pieces and that helps you make your hems. So I hope that this helps inspire you if you would like to make yourself a t-shirt, not just Mally. I think this would be a really good place to grow your sewing skills. Okay, I'm gonna set aside all of these strips except for my uh, neckline piece. I'm gonna need that here in just a second and my shirt front and back. So I'm gonna place the shirt front and back right sides together. So I have wrong side out. And I'm just going to stitch together one shoulder seam. It doesn't matter which one, either one can, it's just fine. I'm just gonna line this up and I'm gonna stitch this together. Now, this is my Janome Horizon 8200. And let's go over real quick. The foot that I am using here is a special quarter inch foot. It does have an opening here. Hopefully you can see this. It has a wider opening in the foot. So I like this. I can actually zigzag with this foot, which is not typical of a quarter inch foot. Uh, and what I really like is it allows me to get an awesome quarter inch seam allowance to the right hand side. And the reason this is important is because this is a machine with nine millimeter wide feed dogs. Those are super, super, super wide feed dogs. Uh, if I use a typical foot where the needle is in the center position, I'm not gonna actually hit the feed dogs hardly at all on the right side. And it really is tricky to actually piece things together accurately. So with this foot in place, I hit the zero six stitch because that is the stitch that gives me a quarter inch with the needle on the right hand side. I'm gonna lower my stitch length to 1.5 and drop the foot down. So that is how I typically get set up whenever I am stitching anything for um, quilt piecing uh, or anything for Mally, really, because all of the seams are quarter inch seams unless otherwise, you know, unless there's something really, really different involved. And that's, you know, most of them I can say are quarter inch seams. So I just stitched through this scrap. This is a little uh, scrap charger just to sort out my thread tails just to get us started on the right foot. And then now I'm gonna take that shoulder seam, slide it underneath so that the pieces are right up against the needle. That's really important. That puts it in jail. So it can't go anywhere else, but go straight onto the fabric. I'm gonna take three stitches on. 
back stitch, hold down that button, three stitches back, then forward, three stitches, stitch off, stitch back on. Now, that's the one thing I gotta say. Um, I have found that this machine likes to grab the fabric as I'm stitching back. It likes to grab it and kind of chew on it a little bit. I'm gonna try this um, button here that is the lock stitch button. I'm just curious. And that's just gonna stitch in place a bit. I like that. I think that's gonna work a lot better. Uh, definitely not going to have that kind of gagging issue. I'm gonna clip off that scrap charger and stitch back onto it. I do that just to keep my machine in stitching mode so it's really easy to keep going and straight into the next thing. Okay, so that is my little seam stitched. I want to go on ahead and finish the seam. You can do this however you want, but I am going to do a little zigzag stitch. And my zigzag stitch, I can actually have a pre-programmed zigzag stitch in here that's on the right-hand side. That's going to be number 12. Okay, and then I'm going to dial that down so it is two millimeters wide by 1.5 millimeters long. So that is the stitch that I'm using. And like I said, this particular foot is special because it's got a wide enough opening here that I can actually zigzag in it. So it's kind of, this is kind of a cheat. <laughs> but, but once I realized it, I was like, oh yeah, I love this foot, especially for doll sewing. Uh, okay, so I'm lining up my stitching line with the groove in the center of this foot. And you know, if you don't have this foot, not the end of the world, you're just going to have to switch your feet. You're gonna have to switch bases back and forth. That's not the end of the world. Uh, it takes a minute, you know, get back on track and be ready for the next thing. But I just, I like not having to switch feet unless I absolutely have to. Uh, it's just one of those time savey kind of things. All right, so now that I have finished that seam, I'm gonna just clean up my scrap chargers here just a little bit so they're not quite so messy. I've got my zigzag, I've got my seam, looks good. I'm gonna just trim that seam allowance close to that zigzag without cutting through it. That is the finished seam. Whenever I say, okay, finish the seam as desired, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna zigzag it and then I'm gonna trim it. Okay, so now I take that and just fold that seam allowance and just do a little finger crease. There we go, and it doesn't matter whether it goes to the front or the back, it really doesn't matter one way or the other. Okay, so now we're gonna take our bias binding. And the bias binding is going to go around the neckline. And this is intentionally cut long, which means that I can have this extend just a little bit off the end of this edge of the neck. We're gonna go all the way around the neckline to the other shoulder seam. But I don't even need to worry about all of that. I'm just going to line this up right at the beginning and I'm gonna start stitching right here. Now, why am I not, you know, pinning this or, in, ooh, ooh. <laughs> now this is an easy mistake to make. I left my mas machine in zigzag. I need to go back to my number six stitch. That's my quarter inch, good. And this is another reason to start stitching on the binding a little bit beyond the edge of your shirt if you make that mistake too. So I was still on the binding, not on the shirt, that's okay. So I'm gonna back up and go forward, okay. So you might be wondering, okay, well, why, why not cut this exactly? You know, why not uh, have it just be exactly so? And the reason is it's just so much easier to just allow the neck and the binding to come together. You're not gonna stretch the binding. I feel like if I cut this just absolutely exact, the tendency to stretch, to overwork, to contort that binding would be very, very great. So that's why, as you can see, this is very, very gentle. I just lay the, I'll line up the raw edges of this neckline, this bias neckline piece. I'm lining up those edges with the edge of the shirt. Lift the foot slightly, few stitches. I lift the foot slightly just to align that and kind of rotate it around. Few more stitches. It really, it's that depth of the neckline that's really the trickiest spot. And then once you get out of there, then it goes a lot faster. But the key here is to not stretch out that biased piece, that biased piece. Uh, and of course, this is just general good advice, I think, for um, all sewing and quilting is make sure to prepare your fabric. So I washed this fabric, starched it, pressed it, made sure that the fabric was nice and stiff with starch before I cut out my pieces. That reduces wiggle. 
that reduces distortion, the chance that the fabric is just gonna wiggle out of shape, and especially bias pieces, make sure that those have been starched real good. You know, sometimes I like to say, you know, get it as stiff as paper. There's, there's no downside to it, uh, you know, other than uh, your finished thing might feel a little stiff, give it a wash, the starch comes right out, no big deal. Okay, so we're coming around, and you can see just how much binding we have. We have quite a bit extra here. I don't, you know, I don't like to be frugal when it comes to this kind of thing, because it just can get so tricky. If it was exactly the right length, number one, I wouldn't have anything to even hang on to as I'm you know, finishing off this edge. As it is now, I can really play with that. I can get that in the right position. I can wiggle that around. It helps me keep things in good alignment and stops the, you know, the either the binding or the shirt from slipping out from underneath and just keeps everything in good alignment. Okay, so there we go. Because I find that the reason why it gags sometimes when I do the back stitch is whenever I have it right on the edge, whenever I have anything like this bias binding is extending beyond the foot, I don't have any problem with it at all. So I don't know, I'm still playing with that. And it's all a part of getting used to any machine. You know, as we work on any particular machine, we're getting used to it, we're getting to know it, we become really good friends with it. So there we go, clip off that other scrap charger. And there we go. That is our shirt with our bias binding attached. And you might be looking at that going, well, it's not facing the right way. It's flipping down rather than flipping up. Well, I'm gonna show you kind of a magical trick with bias binding and how we can just press it and it will kind of just start to do exactly what it's supposed to do. But the very first thing is we need to actually finish the seam as desired. What does that mean again? For me, that means switching to the number 12 stitch, dialing down to two millimeters wide and buzzing back through this with a zigzag stitch. And I'm just lining up the fabric, sorry, the stitching line that I just did with the groove in the center of the foot. And that just makes this so speedy. I'm just buzzing right through it, putting my foot down and getting it done. So quick zigzag stitch. If you have a serger, uh, then you could of course serge that if you wanted to, if you really wanna get you know special. If you have only a straight stitch machine and no zigzag at all, you could just do a second straight stitch through that and then trim it down. So now that I've stitched that, I'm gonna trim this down so that my fabric ends right along the edge of that zigzag stitch. I just trim that down. Try not to cut your stitching, of course, but I usually just kind of aim for those little holes, those little dots where my needle pierced the fabric with the zigzag stitch, not cutting through it, but just right above it, that's perfect. So there we go. While I've got my scissors in my hand, I'm gonna flip this over and you can see how that binding extends. I'm gonna give that a trim right off the top. Go to the other side, same thing. Binding extends that much, trim it right off. So I, you know, the most important thing is just to understand that that binding is not gonna fit exact and you have extra intentionally. Uh, and that's a good thing because it allows you more control and freedom to get that fitted just exactly right. All right, so now I'm gonna bring these two shoulders, the remaining two shoulder pieces into alignment. I want to press, I'm just finger pressing right now, that binding so that the binding is outward and that the zigzag stitching is to the inside of the shirt. I'm just finger pressing that, but I'm not gonna really get too persnickety about it right this second, because really when I take my iron to it, that's when it's really gonna get nicely firmly pressed. But I want that binding to be poking outward so that when I bring those two shoulder seams together, those two shoulders together, you can see I'm gonna have the shirt and then the neckline all coming together. And I want that to be a straight line. It looks like I didn't trim that very straight. So there we go. Now I've got a straight line across and we're gonna stitch this from the neckline to the arm. So we're gonna stitch it across like that. Alrighty, so make sure that you've switched your stitch back to a straight stitch, quarter inch, seam allowance. Press those pieces in nicely, again. Back stitch. See, I don't have trouble when I'm back stitching at the beginning. 
because everything is underneath the foot and that's just fine. It's right here, like right when I'm at the edge that it doesn't necessarily always like. Yeah, so there it goes. It just started to kind of bunch up again. I'm gonna hit that button instead, that lock stitch button and it's just going to stitch in place instead. I'm gonna try and start remembering to do it that way versus doing a back stitch. You know, it's just one of those note to self kind of things. And I have such a habit of back stitching versus hitting that other button. All right, there we go. That is that seam stitched. I'm gonna switch back to my zigzag and finish that. So very, very simple, very quick. We think about our shoulder seams and you might have thought, you know, oh, I should, I should probably, you know, do the whole neckline all in one piece or something like that. That, I played with that quite a lot. It is really hard to do both shoulder seams and then fitting the neckline in. And that's really a different technique too. Most t-shirts are made with binding this way. And if you look closely at your shoulder seams, you'll find that they look exactly like this, where one shoulder seam was sewn before that neckline was put in place. And the other shoulder seam was sewn clearly after that neckline was put in place. It's one of those funny things about clothing. When you start really looking closely at the seams, you can start to tell how things go together. Alrighty, so there we go. That looks good, but this is still wanting to flip down. So let's take it to the iron and show it's who's boss. So again, I'm gonna finger press this neckline down. Really, your fingers are such an important tool because that's gonna just help you know, get things started in the right place, in the right position. And then you can grab another tool and that is your iron, an even more powerful tool and really get it to do what you want. So you wanna be careful with this, um, just not to kind of overdo it. I'm just lightly hitting this and then I'm gonna put my hand on top of it. What that does is that takes the heat of the iron and it presses it into that neckline, into that bias binding. And it says, remember this position. Do not forget it. This is where I want you to go. This is what I want you to do. This is where I want you to be. This is what I want you to look like. And flip it over. I did the front first. Now we can do the back. Press that in place, just like so. Now you might be wondering, why bias binding? Why not straight grain binding? Well, I did a lot of playing around with different styles of necklines on this shirt, and I really wanted a t-shirt look and feel. And everything else that was, you know, required straight grain binding and that kind of thing would have required buttons or something like that in the back. And that's just not what a t-shirt has. A t-shirt is just something you pull over your head. So we needed to have more stretch in this neckline in order for it to be able to go over Mally's head and not end up getting caught in her hair or something like that or just getting stuck around her face. So it, we needed more space. We need this much give within this in order to stretch over her head but then stretch back into position the way it's supposed to go. So this is a little bit wiggly wobbly. You can see I've got that little bit uh, of, a, of a wrinkle here what you can do is you can take a little bit of water and, or just a spray bottle of water, spray that, use a pressing cloth, especially if you're using white fabric, use a pressing cloth and give it a press again. Water steams and will kind of steam that up and encourage that bias binding to lay down flatter. But really the ultimate test will be to put it on your Mally doll after you've gotten finished stitching and see if it actually looks wrinkled because once you put it over her head, that really kind of does some funny things to the fabric and it might not. So I can say that, you know, hasn't happened before that I have seen. Of course it had to happen in the video and that is how I will sort that out. Spray it with a little bit of water, give it a little bit more press, Just try and steam that into submission. All right, so now that we've got our neckline stitched, we're gonna do our arms. So let's get our sleeves going with some nice hems there, and then we'll finish off the bottom edge too. So I'm gonna take one sleeve and place the sleeve hem on top. And the sleeve hem is of course right, I folded this so it's right side out, and I'm going onto the right side of the sleeve. So technically this is right sides together. Lift up that foot. Let's make sure we're on the right stitch. There we go. Straight stitch and quarter inch seam allowance. So there we go. 
and just want to keep all of those raw edges of the hem and also raw edges of the sleeve in nice alignment. And there are three different lengths to the sleeve. You can make the short sleeve, three quarter inch sleeve, or long sleeve. I'm making a long sleeve shirt here. There we go. Line up the second one. Whenever I can, if I have two similar things or two identical things, I'll just go on ahead and batch them out by stitching from one straight into the other. A little bit of chain piecing there really makes things a little faster. There we go. Stitch onto a scrap charger. Okay, so now we're going to finish that seam as desired. There's a, another bit of decorative thing, you know, that you could do here if you wanted to. Uh, first off, finger press that hem so that the hem extends beyond the edge of the sleeve and your seam allowances go down towards the sleeve. And if you wanted to, you could play with the decorative stitches on your machine and stitch a cute decorative stitch across. I think that would be super nice. Uh, you can also just simply finish that seam allowance as desired, zigzag stitch, trim it down close. It's entirely up to you. I'm gonna first do a zigzag stitch. There we go. You can really put your foot down with this machine and speed up and it has a kind of a slow rev. It kind of gets you started slow. And so a lot of times I find myself like jamming my foot on the gas just to get things going. And then once it gets up to the highest speed, I'm like, okay, back off. <laughs> and, uh, then I take my foot right back off the gas again. There we go. That looks good. I'm gonna switch to a, I want a straight stitch that kind of goes back and forth. So that's zero nine. And I'm going to dial that down to two. Let's test that. This is the thing. Every time that you do a new stitch, go on ahead and test it by stitching through that scrap charger and then take a look at it and make sure it looks the way you like it to. And I like that. I'm gonna take my sleeve and trim off that little bit of extra fabric that extends beyond that zigzag. That looks good. And then now I'm gonna take that hem, again, fold it so that the hem extends and the seam allowances go towards the sleeve. I'm gonna feed this back through and I'm gonna do that decorative triple stitch. So basically, this is taking a stitch forward, a stitch back, a stitch forward and stitch back all in place. I'm gonna actually increase my stitch length to three millimeters because I'm going through lots of layers here. Seam allowance, binding, sleeve, all of that in one go. And it can gag it up, you know, it can just slow down and get, you know, a lot to feed through and it can gag up. So having a longer stitch length can oftentimes make that just feed through a little bit easier. Do the same thing on this sleeve. And this is just, you know, kind of an extra, thing that you can do, remember decorative stitches, your machine probably came with a million of them and it's really fun to play with them. So I think try it out, see what you like. It's good to experiment and play with all of those decorative stitches and it really adds that extra little touch to your doll, uh, to your clothing. There we go. Now the one downside I can say about decorative stitching is they do take a little bit more time to stitch because of course your machine is, is feeding the fabric through and going kind of back and forth and all over the place, uh, especially the more elaborate stitches and you just have to allow it to feed it through and take its time. So let me show you what this decorative stitch looked like. Just a nice, nice little stitch right there along that edge. I think that's cute. Okay, so just like before, binding is a little bit longer than it needs to be best way to trim this and make sure that it's trimmed straight is fold the whole sleeve in half so that you can see that angle of how that is supposed to look. You can see that nice straight line and then with both pieces of binding lined up you can trim both of them off nice and straight and that means that they're going to come together really easily whenever you sew the sleeve together. So that's done. Stitch through a scrap charger and get this piece out. I'll do the same thing with it. So again, fold the sleeve in half, bringing those outer edges together 
And so we have a nice straight line vis visibly that we can just line up the edge of the scissors with and cut straight through. That looks great. All right, so now it's time to get the sleeve fitted into the arm of the shirt. And this is one of those things that, you know, I, it's honestly my least favorite part of sewing shirts because inevitably, you know, just fitting that sleeve in, I always end up with a pleat. Uh, so I did a lot of fiddling with this pattern to make sure that this would fit nicely, but the best step that you can always take when you are fitting a sleeve is to run a line of basting stitch. Uh, and so what I'm doing is I'm increasing my stitch length to five millimeters. I'm gonna line this up here. So I am an eighth of an inch from the edge of the fabric. I'm an eighth of an inch from the edge of the fabric. And this is gonna go fast. So watch out for that. You might find yourself, especially when you go around that curve, you need to lift the foot and shift. Another big thing is you want nice long thread tails. So you saw I removed the scrap charger and pulled out nice long thread tails. Now I'm gonna end with nice long thread tails too. I'm going to, sorry, raise the needle first, lift the foot second, bring out and spool out nice long thread tails and then break them nice and long. This leaves nice long thread tails to both sides. So let's do that one more time. I have nice long thread tails to start with. Again, I am using a five millimeter long stitch and I'm lining up the foot so that I basically have the edge of the fabric at the eighth of an inch mark on this foot. And so I'm an eighth of an inch from the edge and it goes fast because of course that's a gigantic stitch. So I need to be careful to oop, stop often and shift. So I'm using my knee lifter on the machine to lift the foot slightly that helps me in guiding that around. Okay, so now needle up, lift the foot, pull the fabrics away. You need the foot up so that way it releases tension so that way you can spool out your thread. There we go. Now we've got two sleeves ready to attach to the shirt. Okay, so here is our shirt and this is going to go right sides together with your sleeve and your sleeve, you should have a mark here at the top. That is the center of that sleeve curve. So you're gonna line up that mark, it was on your pattern piece, so make sure to mark that and you're gonna line that up with that shoulder seam line and we're gonna place a pen. Okay, so remember fabrics are right sides together. Now we're gonna take and pull this side of the sleeve over and align that with that side of the shirt. And the sleeve will extend ever so slightly. There'll be like a little triangle that's gonna extend ever so slightly. Place, place a pen right there. Now I'm gonna take these two thread tails, make sure these are nice and long, and I'm gonna just grab one of them and I'm gonna tug on it. And that's just going to bring and, and kind of cinch up that sleeve. So I'm just, and you can go extreme with this. You can, you can go on ahead and cinch it up nice and tight like that. It's not gonna help you out all that much uh, because you don't need that much gathering. There's less gathering needed in this than we did in Miss Bunny's uh, shoulder, uh, her, her sleeve uh, curve. So uh, this is really not designed to have any sorts of pleats uh, or any sort of fullness. This is really a very uh, flat fit but we have a curve fitting into another curve and that's why it just makes it a little easier to do that basting stitch and to you know just kind of ruch that up, just create a little bit of tension there and start that curve in that sleeve. Now, once you get it where you want it, take the other thread that you did not pull on and give it a little pull. And what that does is that puts tension and locks those two threads together so it's not gonna pull out on you. Now let's take the other side Line this up, leave those nice long thread tails. Place a pen, like so, that looks good. Okay, so now again, I'm gonna take one of the thread tails. Let's take the one in the front and I'm gonna tug on it. Let's you know, kind of go extreme, just for illustration, okay? And then now I'm gonna just smooth it out 
so that now I'm just taking that and I'm just smoothing that fabric to where the sleeve fits perfectly into that curve of the arm. And it should start going kind of 3D. You can see that it's curling inward. Why is it doing that? Because you are creating with this seam, you are creating that 3D effect. You're creating that curve with space for Mally's arm. This is the exact same thing that you do whenever you create a sleeve and a shirt for yourself. You need to have space for your shoulder to fit, otherwise it will be very uncomfortable to wear that shirt. All right, so once you get it where you want it, you can see that that lines up nicely. It's nice and smooth, even though you can see that little bit of a wrinkle in the fabric there, but when you run your fingers along it, there's no excess fabric. It's not gonna pleat. It's very flat and smooth. Now take that second strand of thread that's the one to the back, and give it a tug. What that does is it just locks those th two threads together and ensures it's not going to just, that basting stitch is not gonna come straight out as you hit it with your, as you start to actually stitch these together. So there we go. I am really happy with this. I'm only gonna do one side at a time just to simply keep this a little, a little simpler and easier for you to see. So I'm gonna make sure that those thread tails stay over here to the side. If you wanted to, you could actually knot them at this point and clip them shorter, that would get them out of your way. Do not just clip them though, because then your basting stitch will kind of stop working and you'll have the same, you know, you it'll feel like you have more fabric in the sleeve than you have in the arm of the shirt. So let's zoom in here, really get close to that foot. And I've changed my stitch again to my straight stitch, number six on this particular machine and lowered the stitch length to 1.5 millimeters. I get my needle in it, I just take a few stitches onto the fabric, get my needle in it, and then I take out that pen. And now I'm gonna do that lock stitch, and that is just that circle button that just locks, it just takes several stitches in place. That's very handy. Okay, now we're gonna start stitching. I'm gonna take about four or five stitches, and then just reposition wiggle. That looks good. My goal is just to keep everything nice and flat and straight all the way up to this pen. And once we get there, then I'll take that one out. But I just wanna keep everything nice and flat. And you can just see that little bit of ruching that happens, you know, fitting the one piece of fabric to the other, that little bit of ruching uh, is what is the key to this. And it just, it does really make things a lot easier. When I sewed garments professionally, uh, 60 plus garments a week, I always religiously stitched basting on the sleeves because if I didn't, I'd end up with a pleat because I was working with knit fabrics and it was just always inevitable. I'd always end up with a pleat, so I always did that basting stitch. All right, we're close enough to that center point. Now, if you ever feel something like just something doesn't feel quite right, you know, lift your foot, feel in there, you know, get your fingers in there, see what's going on. Did something flip up? Did that seam allowance flip up? You know, is the fabric pleating? It's a really, really wide foot. So there's a lot that can happen in and around that area. So it's good to just feel like you can stop at any time and check in. All right, shifty, shifty, get that lined up. Now, if ever you feel like there's almost kind of too much tension on that sleeve, just smooth that out. Your basting stitch, you, we tightened it up by tugging on that other thread, but you know, it still has quite a lot of play in it. You can let that out. There we go, a bit more stitching. Pretty much home free all the way to the end. Now I'm gonna try and remember to do the lock stitch before I'm off the edge of the fabric because my, my habit is to stitch off the edge of the fabric and then back stitch. That's my habit. So I'm gonna try and get to a quarter inch from the end and then do a lock stitch and then stitch off the end. That worked out. There we go. All right, stitch onto a scrap charger and we'll check that shoulder. Okay, let's take a look. Flip that back and just kind of give it a little smooth. I'm gonna just generally be pulling those seam allowances towards the shirt and away from the sleeve. 
just with my fingertips and just taking a look at it. Looks like I might have had just a little bit of fabric bunching right here, but honestly not bad. So from here, I'm gonna attach my other sleeve the exact same way. I'm gonna finish the seam allowance on both by doing a zigzag stitch and trimming it down. I'll meet you back here when we're ready to sew the side seams and attach our bottom hem. So this is how your shirt should look at this point. We're going to take one side and align the side of the shirt all the way to the sleeve hem. And if you want to, you can place a pen here at the shoulder seam where the, where the sleeve came together with the shirt. So I'm gonna place a pen right there. And I am generally pressing my seam allowance towards the sleeve here. That just, I don't know, for some reason that just felt right. So there we go. I'm gonna get started. I'm going to stitch from the edge of the shirt down to that sleeve seam and then across and down the length of my sleeve. So let's get started here. Again, slide your fabrics in right up against the needle, a few stitches forward, back stitch or lock stitch, and then forward. I'm gonna go up to that pen and then take it out. And this is, you know, you might have to take a few stitches and then rotate and a few more stitches and rotate just to see where you need to turn that corner. This is a corner that we're turning here as we begin stitching the sleeve. So there we go. And then now I'm looking down here and lining up the sleeve hems. I want those to end up in the same place. So now stitch all the way down, making sure that stays in nice alignment. And again, I'm gonna hit that lock stitch button, just one or two stitches from the edge. So I'm sure that's gonna to lock together nicely and then take those final two stitches. Might hit that lock stitch button again, just see what happens. I think that works really, really well. There we go. Now I'm gonna stitch onto a scrap charger and I'm gonna go on ahead and go straight into finishing that seam uh, because we're only gonna do one of these side seams and then we're going to attach the hem to the shirt. So I'm gonna to switch to my number 12 zigzag stitch, going ahead and finish the seam. So I'm zigzagging along that. Again, if you have a different method of finishing, and you know, really finishing is optional. You don't have to finish the seam if you don't want to. It's not going to fray that much, but I just think it looks nice. And I mean, it's just one of those things that our clothing is nicely finished, so we might as well finish it for Mally too. All right, I'm gonna lock stitch again, just the exact same way we did before. You know, it's just one of those things to get used to, you know, a different method of locking your stitches. And I think it's kind of fun just to mix it up a, a bit. All right, there we go. Clip off my scrap charger. And then I'm going to trim down this seam allowance. Okay, so we are definitely in the home stretch, and I'm sure that you might be thinking at this point to just go straight over here and sew this other side seam, and that would be incorrect because that would leave the bottom edge of the shirt unfinished. And just like all the other ways that we have finished edges in this pattern, we are going to take our bottom hemline. This is the longest piece of binding that we've folded in half. I've got my raw edges right here. I'm gonna line it up so the raw edges are lined up with the edge of the shirt, shirt's right side up. And we're gonna take this and do a straight stitch, quarter inch seam allowance, and stitch it all along the bottom edge. And again, just like before, I cut this intentionally a little long. I just feel like, you know, sometimes, especially with bindings of any sort, and this is technically kind of like a little bit of binding, if we cut it just exact, it does make it more challenging. Uh, it, you know, it, it certainly doesn't make anything easier. So by having it just run a little bit long, then you're not feeling like it's gotta just, you know, you gotta stretch the shirt to make it fit or something like that. Right now we're just smoothing this out, making sure the shirt's completely flat. And then that binding is going on top, completely flat. Nothing's getting stretched, nothing's getting pulled. They're just going together, just exactly the way they're supposed to go together. And you can see how much I'm gonna have extend off this edge, just fine. Go on to a scrap charger. Okay, and 
and then I'm going to go on ahead and finish that seam allowance. So switch back to a zigzag stitch. This is part of the reason, I'll be honest, <laughs> this is part of the reason why I love this foot so much is I was switching feet like crazy, uh, making a few of these shirts, and then I kept switching, 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 and I was like, all right, is there a quarter inch foot that I can get that has a slightly wider opening and that gives me you know, that quarter inch on top of that feed dog so it's on the right hand side and I went searching and that's what I found. So I love it whenever something just works out exactly right and it can do multiple things and I don't have to fiddle with the machine. So fell in love with this foot. You can find this foot uh, at leahday.com. Okay, next we're gonna trim off that excess seam allowance that extends beyond the edge of that zigzag stitch. There we go, get all those schnipplets away. And then I'm gonna finger press that binding so that it extends beyond the edge of the shirt. Just finger press that seam allowance up and the binding down. This is how it's gonna look like from the right side. It just looks so cute when you use two different colors of fabric. I mean, I, I didn't write the pattern that way. And really, you know, this is just the perfect kind of fat quarter, fat eighth, uh, you know, t-shirt. You can use a fat eighth if you use two different colors of fabric. You'll need at least a fat eighth of both pieces because that bias neckline takes up quite a chunk of fabric. It's like a nine inch square that you need at least to be able to cut that strip out on the bias. Uh, and there's really no way around it. So, um, you know, it changes your fabric amount a little bit, but I think it just looks so cute. So there we go. Okay, so if you wanted to, you could also do that decorative triple stitch like we did on the sleeve. You could do another decorative stitch, anything that you want along that hem you know, really whatever you're in the mood for, or you can skip it completely. I'm gonna skip it completely here because you don't have to do any stitching along that if you don't want to. All right, so line up those edges. Like I said, that binding extends. Go on ahead and trim that off. That's just the extra binding. Don't need it. All right, now line up that side. I've got my seam allowances on that sleeve pointing towards the sleeve. I'm gonna go on ahead and pin that. It's just, there's feeling like there's like a little lump of fabric or something funny going on in there. Whenever you don't feel, when something doesn't feel right, you know, investigate it, figure out what's going on with it. Uh, because there, there might be, yeah, there might be like a little lumpy bump or something that you need to just double check. All right, so line this up. Again, I'm pretty sure I'm still in a zigzag stitch. So that's the one thing you gotta remind yourself to constantly be switching your stitches back and forth. So here we go, straight stitch, quarter inch seam allowance, forward and back, and then forward again. And now we're, this is the last seam of our shirt. We're gonna go up to that pen kind of be looking for where we're gonna turn that corner. It's basically right up to that seam and then turn that corner and then straight down the arm. And again, just try and keep these two edges nicely in alignment. If anything, extend the bottom just a little bit because as you go forward, the foot puts a lot of pressure on that top fabric. And it's funny, if you extend the bottom just a little bit, by the time you get to the end, the two will be in perfect alignment. There we go. Let's try and back stitch. Let's see if it'll do it. Ah, did it just fine that time. There we go. Looks great. Switch back to my zigzag stitch, finish that last seam, and we're done. So here is our shirt, and I'm just gonna give this a light press with a hot dry iron. And again, just place your hands on top of it. Smooth that out, feel those shoulder seams, make sure those shoulder seams are facing towards the sleeve. And that will sort out just fine, and now, Moment of truth, let's put this on our Mally doll. So I have found, you know, even with the neckline, you know, we designed that with bias binding, it still can be a little tricky to get this over Mally's full head of hair and her head. So go on ahead and pull her hair through first and then pull her shirt down over her head. And then around that neckline, see, fits just fine. And then tuck her arms up into her sleeves on that side and 
that side. And I just love this little print. I, I really, 1930s reproduction prints are some of my favorites. And I just think that they are absolutely perfect for doll clothing. All right, I got a lot of hair tucked in the back of her shirt. Got to pull that down. So just give this a tug down and there we go. That is a perfect fit. I really love how this comes out. Sleeves are short enough whenever they're the long sleeve that you still see Mally's thumb, that little extend. That looks great. And the shirt is not so long that it's gonna cover up the top of Mally's pockets because that is gonna be a big feature of her pants. Her pants have real working pockets. So there we go. Uh, as you can see, one note, you can see how that bias binding, now that it actually got on the doll, it's smoothed right out. You know, this, this flips forward just ever so slightly, but that's the amount of space that we needed in order to be able to pull it over her head. And, uh, you know, and this is gonna wear really, really well. Your little girls can pull this on and off Mally's head over and over again, it's not gonna matter. And the back looks great too. So I hope that you enjoy making lots of shirts for Mally. So that's it for this tutorial. I hope you learned a lot and that you will be inspired to make many t-shirts for Mally and maybe even sew a t-shirt for yourself. If you'd like to follow along and make Mally or Miss Bunny, you can find both of these doll sewing patterns at mallythemaker.com. Now we have one more video in the Mally the Maker series and that is how to make her pants with real working pockets. This is where really this pattern gets into an intermediate level. There are lots of little steps to this, but it is so much fun. So if you'd like to join in the fun and make Mally with me, all you'll need to do is pick up the pattern available at mallythemaker.com. Until next time, let's go show! <laughs>